YouTube. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Today we're going to be discussing the 14th chapter of microbiology called the principles of disease and epidemiology. So please like, subscribe, and let's get started. Normal microbiota are microorganisms that permanently colonize the host, but they don't cause disease under normal conditions. Or in other words, they don't cause disease as long as they are where they should be. For example, a type of normal microbiota is the bacteria found in your gut. This bacteria is known as your gut flora and it works closely with your immune system to fight off bacteria that may enter your gut and can cause disease. However, if your gut flora leaves your gut and travels up the urethra to the urinary bladder, this could cause an infection. So again, normal microbiota will not cause disease as long as they are in its normal condition. Transient microbiota are microorganisms that colonize the host only for a short period. So this transient microbiota could stay in the body for days, weeks, or months, but they don't last in the body because they're fought off by the immune system. Symbiosis is the relationship between the normal microbiota and its host. And there are three types of symbiotic relationships. There is parasitism, which is when one organism benefits at the expense of the other. And an example of parasitism is when a mosquito bites a human to get blood, but the human suffers with itching, blood loss, and in some cases, a disease. So this is going to be a positive negative relationship because the mosquito benefits at the expense of the human. Mutualism, another symbiotic relationship, is when both organisms benefit from an interaction. And the relationship between a zebra and an oxpecker is a popular example of mutualism. An oxpecker lands on a zebra and picks off its pests and its ticks. This allows the oxpecker to get food, and in return, the zebra gets pest control. This is a positive-positive relationship because both the oxpecker and the zebra benefit from the interaction. Commensalism is when one organism benefits, but the other organism is neither benefited or harmed. Commensalism is going to be a positive neutral relationship. Microbial antagonism refers to the competition between two microbes. For example, the normal gut flora we mentioned earlier. Those microbes in the gut are living, so they need to absorb nutrients and space to thrive and multiply. But if a pathogenic organism that isn't supposed to be in the gut comes and tries to live there, there isn't going to be anywhere for them to thrive because your normal microbiota is soaking up all the nutrients and the space in your gut. Your normal microbiota will also create a hostile environment to make the non-self organisms unable to thrive. There are two main ways to classify infectious diseases, and that is as a communicable disease or a non-communicable disease. Communicable diseases are diseases that are spread from one host to another or anything that is considered contagious. An example of this would be both influenza and syphilis. They are both contagious diseases caused by infection. And then there are non-communicable diseases. These diseases are not caused by a pathogen or an infection, so it can't be spread from one host to another. And an example of this is diabetes. Diabetes isn't caused by an infection, so it isn't contagious. It's caused by blood sugar malfunctions. So let's talk about signs, symptoms, syndromes, and infections. And of course, these all play a big role when classifying infectious diseases. Signs are changes in the body that can be measured or observed as a result of a disease. And I like to look at the sign as the changes in the body that influence the patient to want to go see a physician in the first place. Symptoms are changes in the body that the patient feels as a result of having a disease. Syndrome refers to a specific group of signs and symptoms that come with a disease. Infection refers to the colonization or invasion of pathogens in the body. Contagious diseases are diseases that are easily and rapidly spread. These diseases can be spread by direct contact of the person suffering with the disease, contact with their secretions, or objects that they may have touched. Koch's postulates is a four-criteria system created by Robert Koch. These postulates were one of the first methods created to help us to identify the cause of a disease. These methods are one, the microorganism must be present in every case of the disease. Two, the organism must be isolated from the host and grown in per culture. Three, when the microorganism is placed on a host without the disease, the pathogen grown on the per culture must cause the disease in the host. And lastly, the pathogen must be isolated from the new host and shown to be the original pathogen. 
However, there are some exceptions to Robert Koch's postulates, and that is some pathogens can cause disease only in humans. For example, smallpox is a virus that only affects humans. Some pathogens can cause more than one type of disease. And some microbes have never been cultured, and this is because some bacteria are very difficult or sometimes even impossible to grow in a culture media. Disease occurrences are measured to observe how often a disease may occur within a certain community or population. There are four major classifications of disease occurrences. There are pandemics, which is a worldwide disease outbreak. There are epidemics, which is a disease that many people are acquiring at a time. Sporadic diseases are diseases that only occur occasionally. Then there's something called an endemic, which is a disease constantly present within a population. Diseases go through their own process of development, and there are five stages of disease development. There is one, the incubation period, which is the interval between the start of the infection and when the patient experiences the first signs and symptoms. Shortly after, there is the prodromal period, which is where the patient experiences mild symptoms. Third, there is the period of illness, which is when the disease is most severe. Then the disease will begin to decline. The symptoms and signs will subside. And lastly, there is the period of convalescence, where the body returns back to its normal state. There are three ways a disease can be transmitted. There is contact transmission, which is when you make direct contact with someone who carries a disease. There is vehicle transmission, which is when a disease is spread through the aerosol from a cough or sneeze. Vehicle transmission can also be foodborne, waterborne, or airborne. And then there is mechanical transmission, where an individual receives a disease that is being carried on an insect's feet. Now this can be done in two ways. It can be done through a mosquito bite or by a fly transferring carried pathogens onto your food and then you get sick after eating it. A fomite is any non-living object that is carrying an infectious organism or is capable of carrying one. Examples of fomites can be anything from a doorknob to a hospital bed. A reservoir of infection can be a person, animal, soil, or a plant. Any place where an infectious agent can grow and multiply. The carriers typically carry the disease without being harmed by it, and this is dangerous because the carrier won't know that they have the disease but pass it on to someone else. There are three types of reservoirs. There are human reservoirs, which are humans that carry a disease but pass the disease on to other humans. There are animal reservoirs, which are diseases that occur in animals but can be transmitted to humans. And this is going to be called zoonosis. Zoonoses can be transmitted from animals to humans by direct contact or indirect contact. Non-living reservoirs are inanimate objects that carry a disease and transmit it to humans. Non-living reservoirs can be things such as water or soil. Nocosomial infections are infections acquired in hospitals and other healthcare facilities. To be classified as a nocosomial infection, the patient must have been admitted for reasons other than the infection, as well as having shown no signs of an active or incubating infection. Nocosomial infections are caused by pathogens that are easily spread through the body. Many hospitalized patients have compromised immune systems, so they're less able to fight off infections. In some cases, patients develop infections due to poor conditions at a hospital or healthcare facility, or sometimes even due to hospital staff not following proper procedures. Some patients acquire nocosomial infections by interacting with other patients inside of the hospital. Others encounter bacteria, fungus, parasites, or viruses in their hospital environment. Nocosomial infections are also called HAIs, which stand for Healthcare Associated Infections. There are some factors that can make a person more susceptible to disease, such as gender. For example, women are more susceptible to urinary tract infections, inherited traits, such as the sickle cell gene, climate and weather, fatigue, age, for example, it's easier for a toddler and an elderly person to get sick because a toddler's thymus isn't done developing, and in an elderly person, their thymus starts to deteriorate. This could result in both a toddler and an elderly person being more susceptible to a disease due to their inability to make T-cells. Also, lifestyle, nutrition, and chemotherapy are factors that can make a person more susceptible to disease. Urinary tract infection, also known as a UTI, is the most common type of nocosomial infection. 
Urinary tract infections occur when bacteria colonize the urinary bladder. Women are more susceptible to UTIs because women have shorter urethras than men, and this shortens the distance that the pathogens have to travel to reach the urinary bladder. Urinary tracts are usually caused by E. coli, which is a type of bacteria found in the GI tract, but there are other types of bacteria that can cause urinary tract infections. Nocosomial infections, or HAIs, can be prevented by hand washing, disinfecting tubs in between patients, thoroughly cleaning instruments, and by using disposable bandages. Herd immunity is a tactic used to prevent the spreading of an infectious disease, and this can be done through vaccination, which is a type of artificially acquired immunity. Epidemiology studies the stats and data of diseases, and there are three types of epidemiological investigations. There is descriptive epidemiology, which collects and analyzes data. There is analytical epidemiology, which analyzes a specific disease to try to find out the cause of it. And lastly, there is experimental epidemiology, which is a type of investigation that involves hypotheses and controlled experiments. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC, researches and analyzes infections and develops ways to control them. The Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report is a weekly epidemiological summary for the United States. It's published by the CDC. The morbidity number on the report shows how many people have been infected by a disease in a population. The mortality number shows the amount of deaths caused by a disease. A notifiable infectious disease is an infection that has to be reported to the CDC by a physician. Well, that's the end of that. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Please feel free to send video requests, and I will see you guys next time.